When we arrived at Miami, the first day on campus. That's when the movie Cujo was a hit. I mean, this crazy dog was possessing crazy. Cujo. I recall Jerome Brown and Danny Stubbs. We come into the movie theater. We take over the whole entire movie theater. We're laughing and joking about the dog and the slob and the whole deal. <laughs> Some guy was in there with his girlfriend. He screams and said, tell us to shut up. Why did he do that? Danny Stubbs stood up and he just went off. Jerome Brown got up, went after this kid. When the guy looked up and saw those two stand up and then everybody stood up together. All 13 of us, it was in that movie theater. We're about to kill this kid. I mean, he didn't know exactly we were all together. That was the beginning of the bonding for that class. If you mess with one, you got to see everybody. We never started anything, but we was ready. You know, as that season progressed, I was really dumbfounded when I watched this team practice. They would practice in the heat of the day. We thought we were going to die. We had guys throwing up. They wouldn't have any water breaks. They didn't believe in water. Most days in Miami, it's 85 or 90. And I was often just shaking my head saying, when are we going to have a fatality? They would take bags of ice and they would hide them in the bushes. And if a guy looked like he was about ready to pass out, he'd say, hey, I've got to go to the bathroom. You go over to act like you're going to the bathroom in the bushes, and you rip open a bag of ice, and you just start shoving ice in your mouth. We had a guy named Milton Redwine, one of the top, top tackles out of Pittsburgh. This big 6'6 six, six, uh, tackle, 330-some pounds, he actually got naked on the field. I mean, pulled all his clothes off. I mean, just got butt naked on the field. So we're looking like, man, Redwine is going crazy. That night, Milton disappeared. Even his roommates didn't know where Milton was. When Howard Stellenberg and caught up with Milton Redwine, he was in Tallahassee on a Greyhound bus. He took off. He's like, y'all can have this. This coach is crazy, and this program is crazy. They're not going to kill me. He was going to put a product on the field that was tougher than anybody else's and in better condition than anybody else's. There's no way that you were going to survive this and not win the games. He's going to handle what he can control, and he can control our conditioning, and he used the sun, he used the humidity, and he used the time of day. We've always said that playing a one o'clock game is a seven point advantage. If you are conditioned and you are in great shape in Miami, you will win your fourth quarter. I really wasn't happy at all about a coaching change, but I had an opportunity to sit down with Coach Johnson. And I told him, I said, Coach, I just lost my father. You know, I don't, I don't know about getting into all of these changing of coaches and everything. Coach Johnson looked me in the eyes and he said, Michael, I can respect your thoughts. He said, but let me promise you this. I will be here as long as you are here and we will win. When Coach Johnson came to my high school, he went and had an in-home visit with my mom. And at night, I remember her saying something that ended up being really true. I really like that guy, and I think if you go to Miami, you're going to learn more about life than you will about football. And he taught me a lot about football, but he, he taught us all a lot about life. He started a new tradition, Thursday night meetings. I actually started it uh, to keep the guys off the street because Friday night, you know, you're sequestered, you know, at the motel before the game, and so they're not going to go out. They got a curfew. And so Thursday nights was the, the night that they could go out and howl a little bit. He was always concerned, a city like Miami, that his players were going to get together and a night without curfew, maybe blow off classes on Friday. To get around that, I started having a meeting on Thursday nights at 10 o'clock. It evolved into something that I thought was very important for our team because we never ever talked about football. That meeting was just me with the players and I talked to them about what are you going to do when you leave University of Miami? And don't tell me you're going to play pro football. You tell me how you're going to earn a living. You tell me how you're going to support your family. And I'd go one by one with them and talk about life and talk about how we're going to be successful. And I thought it was one of the most important things that we did at the University of Miami. He's a bottom line guy. If you did your job, you're super fine with him. If you didn't do it, he would really get after you. He wanted 110%. He wasn't going to sell for anything but perfection. He's going to have to win. If he does that, He's my guy. He used to tell the players, I want you to know something, fellas. I got favorites. You're his favorite or you're just the guy on the team? 
Let me tell you one thing about Jimmy. Jimmy's smart as hell. He got a psychology degree, so he was good at manipulating. He was good at motivating. He was good at using scare tactics at the same time. He would just look at you. And be like, oh my God. Every Sunday, the first meeting we had after games was a special teams meeting. You had to watch every single play of that special teams, and he'd be watching, working that clicker. He'd point, he'd point up, and it was about as big as a cinema screen. He'd go, who's that right there? And it would be somebody that would be loafing or something like that, and he goes, who is that? That's me, coach. And you didn't want to be me. You didn't want to be that guy. Guys would move away from you in the room. He became the great motivator of those players. This is for the national championship for Nebraska. I didn't have to run that last snap, but our center and my roommate, Ian Sinclair, had said, oh God, I'm gonna go get the football and I'm gonna keep it. I'm gonna keep it, man. I'm gonna go snag it and steal it before anybody says anything. And I go, oh, that's a damn good idea, bro. So I made him run an extra play, which we didn't need to run, so that he had to snap it to me. And then I ran away from him off the field so he couldn't catch me. I still have it. Right now, school's out. This place up for grabs. Coach Snellenberger, he was the face of our program. For a couple years, even on our program, he was on the cover. It wasn't other players on the cover. And then, poof, he was gone. It was like magic. It was gone. And, and then you're, you're thinking, how can you keep that going? It was very disheartening. And a lot of guys really, really, really wanted to transfer. And I was one of them. And so when he left for bigger and better things, in his mind, we were all left with an uncertainty that that whole Incoming class, myself, Brett Perriman, Michael Irvin, it was just uncertain. We have to get moving and start finding a, a great replacement for Howard Stellenberger. Well, some of the trustees were very upset that I did not hire with them. The name that started surfacing all the time was Jimmy Johnson. And then the barrage of questions, Jimmy Johnson getting his first taste of what life's really going to be like filling Howard Schnellenberger's shoes. I'm not looking for, for changes. You don't change something unless it's broke. And uh, obviously it's not broken. He came in in a very, very tough situation. Wednesday is the day for Johnson to learn all about Miami. All day meetings scheduled between the players, the assistant coaches, and the man who now heads up the whole show. He had a horrible meeting with the former coaching staff. It was very difficult. Some of them were very upset with Jimmy. Certainly I'm upset, but uh, you have to overcome these things and you can't be childish about it and just, you know, you hope for the best and you hope it's the best for the players in the school, you know. There was definite discontent, disharmony, not the overall respect you should have for the, for the incoming head coach because the outgoing head coach had won a national title. I'm Jimmy Johnson. Uh, I'm not someone else. I never heard of Coach Johnson when he came. Never heard of Coach. A lot of UM players thought defensive coordinator Tom Olivadotti deserved a shot. For my benefit, I think it would have been better having Olivadotti because you've got somebody from within, so you're not bringing in that much new stuff. My first impression of him, I got to be honest, I was at Florida Field throwing ice at him. I remember hitting him in the head with a piece of ice, and the ice just bounced off. I think it shattered. When Coach Johnson first came in, there were guys talking about, I'm transferring. They're like, you didn't come here for Howard Schumberger. You came here to play for the University of Miami. We all honored that commitment because we believed in the guys that were there. We didn't want to let the guys down. I really could care less who was coach. I loved Jimmy Johnson and I loved Howard Schoenberg, but you still have to play. There was unbelievable pressure on Jimmy Johnson to succeed. All I hope to do is to have some input and maybe I can add something and maybe you can make it just a little better, and that's what we're gonna to try to do.
Jimmy Johnson leaving, you know, it hurt a lot of people, and, and I definitely didn't want to see him leave. If he did leave, a lot of us wanted to see Gary Stevens come in. We thought, you know, initially Gary Stevens was going to be the next guy in line. I mean, he was offense coordinator. He was inside the University of Miami family. Because of the groundswell of support for Gary Stevens, I had life threats. I had to have bodyguards in my home. Steve basically left because Gary wasn't promoted to head coach. The majority of our coaches had left. The offensive coordinator that I had kind of campaigned for to be the head coach didn't get that job. It just wasn't the right thing for me to come back. I felt like I was prepared to move on to the NFL. Dallas had the most opportunities because they had the worst record the previous year. So they were able to get the first pick of the draft. And Jimmy used that to pick me. I came from a system where I didn't had no clue about picking up, you know, blitzes and the whole deal. And that's probably why I got red shirted, which I wasn't happy about that at all. And he knows it. He said, well, gentlemen, what I'm about to say to some of you guys, you're not going to be very happy. But there are certain guys that we feel need to stay back and red shirt. And that wasn't a plan. That's why I came to, back then, the, 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 the not want to say sorry, you're racing Miami, but the suspect you. He said, anybody got a problem? And he turned to me. Melvin, I said, no coach, I don't have a problem. You can't fuss with House Delaberg. I mean, this is like, quote unquote, the Don, you know? And I'm like, ah. I called my mom from the dorm room. I said, call the University of Pittsburgh and tell Coach Pazio I'm on my way. I'm leaving. She said, what do you mean? I said, I'm not gonna stay here. They gonna redshirt me. I mean, that's an insult. This, these people, sorry, they suck. How they gonna redshirt me? I mean, you know, I felt like I, I could have came in and helped the program. And I'm like, no, there's no way you can't redshirt me. I mean, he, Alonzo is playing, and Winston Moss, and also Greg Rico's Jerome Brown. I mean, they're my boys. I love them, but they can't hold a stick to me. My mom, she's like, you're not quitting, and you're not going anywhere. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, you're not, you're not quitting. You're gonna stick it out. You made the decision. You made that choice. It's probably the best thing for you. I was like, lady, you really don't know football. How are you going to tell me about, you know, what's best? Mentally, I, I, I feel like I could compete with the best in the country, but I wasn't strong enough. What Howard did at the end of the day was the best thing for me. Those practices were the most demanding things I've ever experienced in my life. I can't imagine practices that were harder. I had never been through so many hard practices before in my life. And basically was a punching bag out there first year. I wanted to quit every week. At the end of the day, you couldn't even feel your legs. Brad Shirey, he uh, broke his leg. When I say he broke his leg, he broke his femur in the first drill of the first practice. Coach, you know, looked at Brad on the field rolling around and then said, okay, move it up 10 yards. Let's continue the drill. They really mean business here. We busted our butts. I mean, we went at it. I think several guys went home at night and thought about quitting. There is no way that you're going to work this hard and get this stuff drilled into you by a field general from hell and not get the payoff. The payoff has to be winning. And, and that's what we did. We won. Practice was sometimes harder and more intense than the actual games on Saturday. It's, it's harder than the game. You hear people say that the game is easier than practice. That is real. Our toughest competition was in practice. Game day rolled around, it was like, wow, this is easy. The games were the easy part for us. We were just in the toughest week that we've had, you know, in the last year of practice, and these guys would show up on game day uh, playing against us, and they weren't ready. On Saturday, it was a cakewalk, because our toughest battles were in practice. Practice was a lot faster, a lot fiercer, and a lot more competitive than any game that I played at University of Miami. I remember we'd have Leon Searcy going up against Greg Mark. Uh, I, just incredible battles. That's the best game you ever want to see in your life because every day we've taken it to another level. Anytime I had to line up against a Michael Irvin, a Brett Perryman, a Brian Blades, Alfredo Roberts, Charlie Henry, all of those guys went to the National Football League at their respective position. And believe me, we used to beat the crap out of each other in practice. And so it made Saturdays that much more fun. If I can get respect from these guys, I'm a darn well get respect, and I'm gonna demand the respect from anyone else.
there was a lot of excitement going into the season. I think 87, we knew we still had just as much talent as we had the year before. There was one huge question mark on our football team, and that was me. Steve's first practice was very scary, but I tell you about that kid, he worked and he worked and he worked. Yes, I wasn't Vinny Testaverde, but at the same point, the speed that we had on defense, the speed and talent we had on offense, now it was just my job to put it in the playmaker's hands. He was very, very sharp and knew exactly how to manage the game. The level of nervousness before uh, every game in 87 concluded with me vomiting, which uh, by the eighth or ninth time, it became ritual in the locker room to find out, hey, did Walsh throw up yet? And of course, yes, I did, and okay, good. You know, my stomach was doing cartwheels, but they were at ease that, okay, he threw up, we're gonna win. Steve was basically that tweener type kid, you know, not overly gifted athletically, but he could dissect the defense. I was born in uh, Ocala, Florida. I moved to Gainesville to go to high school. Been recruited probably since the ninth grade, illegally, I might add, by the University of Florida. I still can remember Coach Solinger, Don Solinger, coming out to our practice one day. Here it is, this guy comes out in the University of Miami jacket, and, and I, I said, I can't believe that's Miami out here. And you know, I wanted to go up and say, hey, I'm Lamar Thomas. And, and actually, I, I did walk up to him and I said, hey, Coach, uh, I'm Lamar Thomas, and he said, I know. And that was the start of my uh, relationships with the uh, University of Miami. When Michael Irvin called, I had to make that trip. To be able to come down and hang out with that guy was amazing because his confidence level was what I, I took from that. He had a 280ZX or something like that. And, and on the front of it, it said playmaker. And people waving at him in South Miami. Everywhere we went, people stopping him. I was like, man. You are the man, and he, you know, he told me point blank. He said, "They said you're pretty. You could be pretty close to me." And I said, "What do you mean?" He said, "They said you're pretty good, man." I said, "Well, I mean, I'm not as good as you." He said, "I know." Lamar Thomas, I said to him, "I want to make sure you're worthy of being a hurricane. I want to make sure. What are you talking about? Like they recruited me? I don't care what they're doing. I want to make sure you're worthy of being a hurricane." But he said, "If you work hard and you come down here." And, get with me, I'm pretty sure when I leave, you might be able to take over. I want to see, son. I want to see if you can replace these hands. These hands are leaving and going to the pros. I want to make sure you can replace these hands. I'm the one that's on ABC, CBS, PBS, TNN, every station, every week. And that's all people see. You come down here, you'll be on TV every weekend dominating. I thought about it. I said, man, where do I sign? 